Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast featuring Phil Perry. This is the aftermath. And Phil, good news for everybody. It's the aftermath of a moral victory. 25 to 20, the Patriots toppled by the Philadelphia Eagles. However, when we're looking for silver linings, and for me, I always am, I look at a team that was down 16 to nothing and outscored its counterparts, the NFC champion defending NFC champion Eagles. They outscored them 20 to 9. They allowed a field goal and a touchdown, uh, touchdown on early drives. And then after that, it was punt, 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 field goal, field goal, field goal, punt, 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 downs, fumble, downs. So to me, what the Patriots did far exceeded, especially defensively, anything I anticipated them doing. I actually thought they were better on defense than I anticipated. And I thought they were pretty good on offense once they got their head out of their ass cheeks. I would agree with you on both counts. Uh, I thought this defense was tremendous. And maybe I, I had built in a little bit of a slow start for the Eagles because they didn't play in the preseason. They, di- they didn't play at all. I mean, we, we criticized the Patriots at times for not doing much in the preseason. They did nothing. So I assumed it might take some time, but it really felt like they never got into a rhythm, Tom. They got hurt on a couple of quarterback scramble- scrambles, and they were – you know, gifted two touchdowns by Patriots blunders early on, but they were really, really good. It was a mix of zone and man is what I was told after the game. They were disguising. They were, there was pre-snap movement. There was feigned pre-snap movement. There were blitzers who were coming and then they were not coming and it looked like cover zero and then it wasn't cover zero. I think they really messed with the heads, not only of Jalen Hurts, but of, of his offensive line. And it led to some of the numbers you saw. I think on a per pass basis, the Eagles only averaged 4.3 yards Mm -hmm. and they were 3.9 yards per run. I mean, that's tremendous against an offense that was one of the best in football a year ago. What sickened me and most Patriots fans is the fact of the circumstances around falling into the 16 to nothing hole. Look, if you're going to be the Patriots, if you're going to be the Bill Belichick Patriots, I don't care what Tony Romo says when he says, wow, these teams don't really lose sloppy. Yeah, they do, Tony. That's been what they've been doing for the last 900 plus days. They're sloppy. And the first quarter consisted of a Dietrich Wise offsides that wiped out a muffed snap on a second down. So a third and 15 was in the offing. No, it ends up being a first down and they end up with a field goal. Then you have a pick six on a poor throw for Mac Jones, a ricochet pick. That ends up in the hands of Darius Slay off of Kendrick Bourne. Bad throw. Followed immediately. So now it's 10 to nothing. Followed immediately by a high throw behind Zeke Elliott by Mac Jones. Still, Zeke Elliott had the opportunity to retain the ball, turn, move up field, and did not have his five points contact, which resulted in a fumble. And then that touchdown ensuing comes when Kyle Duggar has a hold on a third and 12 sack or a sack that would have been a third and 12. So just like the first drive, a touchdown follows, excuse me, points follow after a unforced error defensively results in a flag. So we're sitting there, and then when there was a Juju Smith-Schuster drop, and they were in a position to compete against a good team, but they couldn't get out of their own way because they were playing non-patriot, undisciplined, lack of poise, lack of detail football, which pissed me off because I thought that was the easiest thing to fix. And then they fixed it. So am I like, you know, the really nice, you know, coach or parent that says, well, you needed to fix it and you did. So I'm not happy about how it started, but you did the things that you were supposed to do. So let's get after it and pick it up where we were off. Or do I flip out and just hammer those first 12 minutes so I never see it again because the other part is what they're capable of? Which way do I go? Or you can give me the Juwan Bentley as is he this, did the other day well, and say, what's the question? What's the question? Um, No, I would say, unfortunately for them, if they have those mistakes, and Tom, even if they have half of the mistakes they had tonight, against good teams, it's going to be really hard for them to win. I don't know if the defense is so good that they'll be able to to keep them in games if if they're shooting themselves in the foot that consistently against the Bills or even 
mm -hmm. Jets or the Dolphins. You know, it's just it, you have to be on those details, and they just so happened to all happen at the beginning of the game tonight, it felt like. Although there were a couple that happened late from receivers that we can talk about if you want to get into those. Sure. Later. But you, you just can't have that many, and you probably can't even have half that many. And it it could end up being the story of this team. Their margin for error in 2023 is is going to be relatively slim. And so if you have a couple of the big ones like you had tonight, that, that could be it. It's too big a hole for you to come back from against a good um, team. Yeah, we look at some of those games last year. Like, for instance, people would talk, and I could roll four off right quick. People look at the Miami game, the loss in the opener, and say, you know, they could have won that game if if this happened or that happened. Uh, the Cincinnati game where there's a fumble by Ramondre Stevenson in the red zone, ah, oh, they could have won that game. Same thing with the Vegas game. There's another game in there too. And in all those games, I'm like, yeah, but, I mean, you lost against Miami because you couldn't do anything on offense. You lost 13 to seven or 20 to seven. And you'll let up a strip sack touchdown and you got beat on a fourth and seven for a touchdown on a missed tackle. You lost 22 to 18 to the Bengals, but you were down 22 to nothing. The Bengals basically stopped playing. You were never a threat on offense. There was a pick six that cut you into it and then a ricochet touchdown. The Raiders game, you sucked in the red zone. You were an embarrassment. You couldn't get anything going. So all of those games I looked at and said, those were one-score games. It really weren't one-score games. You just dumbed into being in the game. This was a one-score game. Oh, the Baltimore game was the other one. You know, you get guys running horrible routes in the red zone. The mistakes in this game were different, I think, and they augur a different type of team, a team that is better than I think most people thought. I think the Patriots are better than people thought. Agreed, but they still make those mistakes that good yeah, teams don't right. make. So you're until right. they stop making them, that's kind of what they are. And so they're an 8-9 and nine team that's better than that as opposed to an 8-9 and nine team that's worse <laughs> than that, which is what they were last year. Listen, and I, I'm with you. I see silver linings here, You know, number one with the defense, but number two with, with the passing game. I thought what they did to hide what was a disaster situation on the offensive line, a disaster worst case scenario calvin anderson nfi misses all of training camp has to start at right tackle against arguably the best defensive line in football city so plays tackle all training camp after playing guard <laughs> the vast vast majority of his career in college as a rookie and then the last couple of weeks with us out of practice he starts getting reps at guard and has to start against one of the best defensive lines in football fifth round pick Antonio Maffi, who was a defensive tackle a couple of years ago at UCLA, has to start against one of the best defensive lines in football. And how many sacks did they have? One in the game? They two, ended up with two. They got yeah, one late. I think so. I think I, I yeah. And the Patriots had three. And I think they schemed <clears throat> around them often early in the game, Tom. Especially felt like they were really focused on the quick game. And man, those Eagles defensive backs were so aggressive, and they were right on top of them, and there was nowhere to go with it. But as the game wore on and they had to push the ball down the field, I thought Mac Jones had time for the most yes, part. Yes, he did. He had time on the throw he... to Kendrick Bourne. That's what pissed me off on the throw to Kendrick Bourne. I was like, hey, good pocket. And then the ball sailed. I went, well, what? what? And so, you know, that that's, that's good news. That's a good thing. It's a good thing that Bill O'Brien used empty as often as he did to try to get the ball out of Mac Jones's hands quickly to allow him to be a point guard and just distribute. It's a good thing that they had success in the red zone. Three red zone touchdown passes for Mac Jones tonight. I mean, that, that was like a, a half a season last year. So there, there is certainly plenty of good to take away from this. But you just keep coming back to those mistakes because you just, you're sensing a trend now from one year to the next. Yeah, yeah, they're too good a team to excuse it. So when I ask that question, which way should you go? I think Bill should probably take an absolute sledgehammer to them. Meanwhile, Mac Jones took a little bit of a sledgehammer to himself for those mistakes and for his late game performance, Mac really didn't throw any good passes on the first drive. So uh, definitely a slow start and it starts with me. I uh, just got to watch the tape and, and clean it up. But definitely felt like we fought hard. The rookies played really well. The offensive line played really well. The skill players played really well. So definitely let the team down tonight. Couldn't couldn't score, you know, early, and we just fell behind because of me. And uh, I put it on myself. See, being a little over dramatic there. 
man, he's really shouldering the blame here. And uh, in an over the top kind of manner, I, I really, I don't know. It seemed genuine to me, but yeah. I think the rest of the team, I was interesting. I asked Matt Judah what he thought of it. You know, this guy's been really hard on himself. He's like, we don't care about that. Actually, you know what? Let's just get that sound. Can we just get Matt Judon to say it? Because I'm not going to do a good Matt Judon impression. Oh, oh yeah, Matt Judon. Uh, I think as a quarterback, that's kind of how you got to uh, come up here and talk to y'all. But we don't care about that. Like, uh, Matt went out there and, and played his butt off. Uh, it was unfortunate. We got a couple bad calls. We got a, a couple penalties here and there. Uh, we, can, we can't. We can't put that loss on Mac. Mac, Mac played his butt off, and uh, every opportunity that he have uh, had, he uh, made made him count. And so, we gotta, as a defense, we just gotta do a better job of keep getting him the ball back. Like we we gotta play. We gotta play whatever situation we in. That's how we gotta play it. So, I think it's good. On the one hand, you're the quarterback. It's I I I I screw up. We lost. I screwed it up. On the other. I think the rest of the team will will allow him to understand that it wasn't exactly the case, even though he did throw it 54 times or whatever it was, the ball was in his hand quite a bit, right? Don't you think they'll they'll pick him up a little bit this week? Well, I mean, honestly, I think every player tends to, the same way you and I do when we work together, I want you to do well, you want me to do well, but when we're driving home, I'm not thinking about the shit you could have done better to make our product better. I'm thinking about the stuff I could do because I think that you do a good job. Maybe you don't think the same about me. We'll get into that after. But I think that every player is so self-focused that unless you're the kicker and you like kick it off the long snapper's ass at the end of the game, you're basically going to focus on what you did or didn't do. Generally, unless there's an epidemic of bad play from one player killing you. You know what, though, Tom? So, I think last year, I think there were times last year where the defense was looking at the offense like, oh, you're right. Damn. That was an epidemic. Guys, oh, they were looking at the coach. Can you stay on the field for longer than 30 seconds, please? One time. Yes. But it's not an epidemic yet. So I think that they're probably, but I hated the sack that Mac took. I think he was a little confused. Actually, Ted and Steve Hamlin are going to go over this on Monday Night Breakdown. Steve's already uh, circled this, the second down play with about three minutes left. They want to look at a little wrinkle that the Eagles appeared to do in coverage. But I hated that sack. I friggin' hate sacks. Um, confusion sacks in in key moments because they remind me of the Minnesota game last year because that was a game where it shaped up. All right, Matt, stage is set, table's ready, come on down, get your get good eating here, make a legacy, and a little bit of a failure to do that. Last year was worse, no shot. Um, tonight, I was kind of excited as a as a consumer. You know, I know I'm a journalist, but I was excited as a consumer for the storyline of Mac Jones comes in and does this with Brady in the house. And he finally has a comeback where he says, give me the ball. I want the ball. I'm going to do this on my own. And it works out. And that that didn't happen. But it was there to happen. And it was a Kayshawn Booty toenail away from happening. And I know it sucks, but I still I'm not even mad at Kayshawn Booty. Both of them were nice catches. They didn't hit him in the face mask. I mean, they suck that bad that my bar is very, very low. Does he get the free pass because he's a rookie? It happened twice. He gets the free pass because the first one was proprioception. You guys can Google that if you like to. One of my favorite words. It helps me with my golf swing. So proprioception was not good for him on that play. Additionally, on the second one, he did get pushed in the lower back, which accelerated him out of bounds. Um, so he's going to have to work on the toe tap. But I, I think that the first one was was a little less excusable than the second one. I, I get why the second one happened. And so before I say this, I do want to point out it was it was far from a perfect game for Mac Jones. But goodness, the drops. I mean, how many drops are you allowed to have in one game before? Was you Kendrick just... Bourne's a drop? I'm in the school of there can be drops on bad throws. So, yes, I thought Kendrick Bourne. You're talking about the pick six? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the one down the middle converging cornerbacks, but so the ball hit his bread back. I, it's a good question. I still haven't got a great look at it. I was flabbergasted that that football got to where it got. Watching from the angle where we were right behind Mac Jones, he got clobbered 
And I thought there was no shot it would even have enough on it to get to where it needed to go. And then it got fit somehow into a very tight window and looked catchable. It hit both the ends. The it, it hit the catch. It what the what do they call it? The catch pocket, pocket catch, whatever. You gotta, you have to catch it then. If that's the case, I, again, I still haven't even seen it a second time. You have to catch it. That's a monster play. It's third and twelve with the game on the line, and the guy made the throw of his life. I mean, it, it, that's got to be one of the best throws he's had as a pro. Am I thinking? I might be thinking of the wrong play. I'm talking about the throw over the middle, sliding. I know. Kendrick I, I was getting a coffee before. Um, <laughs> Come and, on. But there were TVs everywhere, and I turned, and I came back, and I saw the sack, and then I turned, and I saw Matt coming off, and they had the camera on Hunter Henry, so I thought it was a Hunter Henry drop, and then I saw the replay, so I'm a little bit, you people are sitting there going, is this how our media people watch these games? No, we'll watch it again later, but we don't have a DVR in our frigging green room, so embarrassingly enough, if I miss a play, I have no recourse except to ask Ted and Holly and Garcia. And I think that's the play. I uh, yes, it was uh, that was the play. Anyway, you got you gotta he can't catch it for you. You know, I'll say that for him. As hard as he is on himself and as hard as we should be on him for some of those throws, especially early in the game. That two was those ass two too. throws get caught, Tom. The game the game, it's a different game. If that third and twelve gets caught, all of a sudden it's first and ten. You've got two twenty ish yep. left at the Philadelphia thirty yard line, and you're moving the ball and you're feeling good about yourselves. You know, I, it it was just after last season, and I know we kind of have to just get that out of our system and we can't just be comparing everything to last yep. season because everything will be a win if we compare everything to last season. But even Bill Belichick, I thought, showed some real outward positive emotion toward his offense. I agree. After the, I believe it was the second touchdown to Kendrick Bourne. Oh, I didn't see that. I thought you Mac know, Jones came off off the field over to the sideline. He really didn't go into the end zone to celebrate. But they score. He sort of just jogs off, head down, nothing over the top. But Bill Belichick says something to him as he's as he's sort of running by. And, it, and you know, Mac, it looked like maybe kind of gave him a little nod. He goes right over the bench. Bill wasn't satisfied with, with the message that he got across to Mac because he followed him all the way to the bench, gave him a big high five, gave him a bunch of little slaps on the knee, had a couple positive words for him, slapped Bill O'Brien on the knee. He was feeling good about what they were doing at that point. I think he was trying to give them some sort of positive reinforcement too, because the slow start had been so bad, but you just don't, we're not used to seeing that sort of stuff from Bill Belichick. So I think even that is a little bit of an indication of, okay, it's going to be a lot different this year. The product is going to be a lot more exciting to watch for the people at home. No question. Hey, get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed plus all customers who bet five dollars will get one hundred dollars off nfl sunday ticket from youtube and youtube tv now is the best time to join FanDuel. the app is easy to use and you can be on everything from spreads to player props and so much more so visit fanduel.com slash nsbo and kick off the nfl season with an offer you won't want to miss. That's FanDuel.com slash NSBO. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Massachusetts. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Hope is here. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. Play smart from the start. GameSenseMA.com or call 1-800-GAM-1234. NFL Sunday ticket offer ends 9-18-23. No refunds. Terms and embargoes apply. $100 off NFL Sunday ticket, not YouTube TV. YouTube TV base plan required to watch YouTube TV. Redemption requires a Google account and current form of payment. Commercial use excluded. Subscription renews. Cancel anytime. Did you feel when it was 16 to nothing that it was a Bailey Zappi game? No, but I You're was. Kidding. I was. Were you uh, Were you anticipating Brady chants mid-game? We didn't really get those. Uh, I thought we might I, get those. Uh, if it kept up. If it kept up. It just happened so fast. I don't think people could have had time to synchronize. Um, Mac Jones did get a nice ovation from the crowd the first time he showed up on the Jumbotron during play 
So not during warmups or anything, but you know, he gets on the field, they show him he got he got a big ovation from the crowd, which I was a little, you know, I'm sure it felt nice for him after getting booed here last year and having the Bailey Zappi chance and all that. It was a it was a nice little moment for the guy. It felt like the crowd sort of had his back. I have been reserved about anointing the Patriots and elite defense and even been reserved about calling them what we would call a top five or top 10 defense, even though there's a lot of statistics that indicate last year was terrific. The reason I do that is I come up with stats like the Patriots held in back-to-back weeks, the Colts and Jets to three for 28 on third down. That's not great. And against playoff teams, when playoff teams got into the red zone against them in seven games, they scored 77% of the time. Touchdowns. That's a lot. So I needed to be shown something by the Patriots against a good team, not seeing a performance like we saw against the Vikings or the Bills a couple of times. The last game against the Bills was better off defensively. Or against Lamar Jackson or against Justin Fields. I needed to see the Patriots' defense perform the way they did today. What's the number one, and I have an answer in mind here too, so I'm kind of loading up to ask a question that I want to say. What's the number one attribute you're seeing about the Patriots' defense that's allowing them to play with better success against a good team today? I think it's their front. I think it's their front, which allows them to get creative and be versatile on the back end. I think because they are talented up front with Uche and Judon, uh, I don't know how effective Barmore was tonight. He was out there quite a bit, it looked like. Dietrich they did Wise, have one pressure, yeah. Keon two White. bad penalties, but Wise had a few pressures of his own. I thought Keon White made an impact when he was out there in passing situations. When you have that many capable pass rushers, they're not the Eagles, but it does free them up to make the most of these versatile positionless players they have on the back end because they can get weird and say, you know, you four, whoever it is, you four just get after the quarterback. We're not going to be sacrificing. They, they did they did blitz a little bit in this game, but they don't have to to get pressure. And when they do, when they sprinkle it in, it looked like it was really effective. Christian Gonzalez on a sack. Matt Judon's unblocked, completely unblocked sack was because they confused the Eagles offensive line and they left Matt Judon unblocked. So they can do a lot of different things. They're smart and they're versatile, but I think it's I think it starts with the front. It's the front that really allows those other things to shine. I think it's overall team speed going from a 61 to about an 88 to a 90. I, it was a 61 two, two or three years ago. I mean, they were embarrassingly slow. Remember when we talked to Mayo at the Super Bowl and we talked about leadership, but they were just, it was a slow team. Mm. Um and I think they've just gotten faster and faster. Might have been 2019 we talked to Mayo. I think you're 20, right. I remember the, the 2020 the Josh the Allen, 2020 Super Bowl. Remember the Josh Allen sneak, and it was like it was like happening in slow motion. They couldn't get there was a game here, and they were headed that way toward the lighthouse, and he sort of snuck it around. I think Jamie Collins was on the field, Dante yeah. Hightower was on the field, and they just you're right. You're right. They've gotten much faster. Fast, fast, fast. You know, whether it's Mapu, whether it's Tavai, who's a fast player, Juwan Bentley is seemingly playing faster. Maybe because it's a confidence thing, or maybe because it's a deployment thing. But I think Steve jo- Belichick and Jerome Mayo are getting the most out of that defense right now. We got all week, actually. We'll be back at it again on Tuesday with another Patriots Talk podcast and Phil Webb we'll next Pats, and we'll kick it around. Um, we could do a million different amounts of sound. Uh, for this, we've only hit on Mac and Judon right now. I'm going to throw one more in from Nick Sirianni talking about the Patriots um, just in general, because I think it, it's not an empty praise for the Patriots where they're praising the specter and genuflecting to Bill Belichick. It's, it sounds concrete. Nick Sirianni, go ahead. How do you think the defense looked? I mean, a lot of new starters, new faces. Um, Yeah. They, you know, anytime you create two turnovers that lead to 14 points, that's big time, right? Uh, that's the difference in the game, right? Uh, Jordan making that great play on the screen, and then also uh, the the coverage that happened and the pressure that happened on the interception for a touchdown that Slay finished. Slay's got a great knack to get the ball and finish plays like that. And, you know, and so, you know, obviously we, we have a lot to clean up on all phases, uh, but I was pleased with the defense and the pressure that we got. And, uh, you know, and the, and the, you know, it was – 
there was some pre Mac Jones. I thought did a really nice job, and, and Bill O'Brien again. Two, you know, I, so much respect for for Coach O'Brien. Uh, man, I've, I've seen him call plays for a long time, being in that division. And I just think he's an outstanding play caller, and he did a good job of you know getting the ball out of Mac's hands, and Mac did a good job of seeing it. But where I was really excited was. You know, there was a couple times there. I'm like, we gotta get to this quarterback at some point. And then, you know, in two of the biggest moments in the game, we did. Um, and so, you know, but that that's the waves that we can come out at uh, with the defensive line. So great job by them. Uh, also, uh, great job by us to get to the quarterback when uh, when we needed to. Brings me now to, what do we look at next week? This is an improved team, Phil. They're gonna play uh, the Dolphins next week. You look at what the Dolphins did. Tyreek Hill has 215 yards, two of throws for 466. They beat the Chargers on the road. But I look at that, and I'm like, well, if the Chargers scored 36 on them. Excuse me, 34 on them. And the Patriots are as confusing defensively as they was for the Eagles, as they were for the Eagles. And the Eagles have a better offensive line than Miami. And the Patriots have Jonathan Jones to deal with Hill. I think New England can, can do some things to bother Miami in a way that the Chargers didn't. And I think that this win, this moral victory, will travel and can result in a legitimate win over a legitimate team where it just absolutely takes the Dolphins and twists them by the face mask and sends them back to South Florida. Yeah. Patriots win 30 to 21. Wow, am I ahead of myself? That is the earliest prediction we've got on record. In the history of the Patriots Talk podcast, especially since I believe we have two more podcasts to do before this game is even played. Developing, developing it. take. I appreciate it. I appreciate you for it. Um, yeah, they can't let uh, Tyreek Hill go for 200 plus. And I think they will have a, they will have a better, they, they will have a better, uh, those are our wonderful photographers, Bob Hood and Bill Messina. Oh, hoodwink of the moose. Uh, I'm not giving you a prediction right now. But you think this win can travel? You think this momentum well, wasn't? Well, this is what is important. I mean, this loss. Christ, they lost, Tom. It's not it's a win. The moral win. You're talking about the moral win. Yes. The moral win is only a moral win in the future. I like this point that you all made on the post-game right. show tonight. We can't sit here and call it a moral victory right now. Can't do it. I won't have it. However, if they show up on Sunday night next week against the Miami Dolphins and they have those mistakes cleaned up and they look like the offense that showed up in the third quarter and they look like the defense that had one of the best offenses in football last year with everyone returning flummoxed, then yeah, maybe we can look back at this and call it a moral victory. But uh, this has been... This, this moral victory conversation, I am continuing it. I'm going to use a, a legal term. This is It's been continued. It's been delayed. Okay. It's been put off until next week after the Dolphins game. Can we do that? Yep. All right. Um, all right, everybody. We got a lot of work to do still, a lot of writing, a lot of conversing. I'm sure we have, like, television things to do. But uh, I like the way the Patriots season started. So 0-1 on the scoreboard, 1-0 in our hearts, or at least mine, or in my head. It's actually more in my head. I mean, yeah, I'd like to cover a good team as opposed to a bad team. But um, I think, honestly, I mean, over the course of time, I feel like I, I've kind of – I know what I'm looking at. When they were 5-3 and three last year and then people would tell me it was a good team, I said, no, it's not a good team. They're only one now, and I'm saying this is a good team. I know what I'm frigging looking at. Can I ask you a question? What are you looking at? Still a 10-win team in your opinion? Oh, yeah. That'll do it, Chuck. Goodbye.